Oh my gosh, what did I do? Worst timing. All right, I think I got to now. All right. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for logging on and attending this afternoon's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, please let me know if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. You can send those to me in the chat. Uh, any questions that you have, you can send via the Q&A button. Um, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. I'd like to now introduce Ashley Rooney, a prolific author and the past president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club. Ashley has hosted our weekly gardening series this summer. And while today is our last session until she returns in September, uh, we are incredibly grateful uh, for the wide cast of gardening experts and topics that she has brought to the library. I'd like to thank you, Ashley, um, and everyone uh, for coming. Um, so now please welcome Ashley. Thank you, Matt. And isn't this a stupendous day to sit in an air-conditioned room and watch Georgia Harris, who is a great presenter uh, for garden clubs, uh, for this broadcast, and a master gardener herself. And we're going to talk about the year-around garden. And when I thought of that topic, I thought I'd go to Georgia. She would be the perfect person to help put it all together. So let me introduce Georgia. Oh, she did ask that we save all the questions to the end of her presentation. I will do a little bit after that. We can break in there and do hers, your questions and then go on, okay? Take it away, Georgia. Hi, Ashley. Um, thank you first to Carrie Library um, for doing this for us. What, what a tremendous resource you are. And thank you, Ashley, for inviting me. And also thank you all the listeners who have shown up every week what you have made this, you know, a wonderful community. So what I would like to do today is I want to take you on a journey through the garden over the course of one year. And I'm going to now attempt to share my slideshow with you. <laughs> Hang on one second. There. There we go. <laughs> I did it. Um, so, um, welcome to Four Seasons of Gardening. Um, this um, first picture is um, a picture my husband took of a Carolina silver bell, and um, I thought it was a nice way to start this slideshow. So let's, let's talk about some basics for four season design. First of all, it's very important that you have plants with multiple seasons interest. You, I like to limit my use of what I call one trick ponies. For example, for Scythia. You really gotta like it's one trick, which is that really kind of garish yellow that comes out in spring. And if you don't like that garish like yellow, that's kind of really all that for Scythia has going for it. So I'm giving you permission to rip it out and move to something that has a little bit more appeal throughout the seasons. Lilacs are also an example of something lacking multiple seasons of interest, but that's kind of okay with lilacs because we love the smell of lilacs. And so I make room for them in my garden, even though I know at the end of the year, they will be mildewy and overgrown. Lilac Sunday is such a part of our Boston tradition so I give them some space in my garden. So you can figure out what you would like to have space for in your garden. And of course, you know, I'm the bee lady. So I'm going to say we need to be focusing on feeding native pollinators. And for, environment, for environmental impact, what this means is we need to feed people, not just from May, June, and July. We need to feed them eight months out of the year. We need plants that bloom from March to October, and we need to plan for that. And sounds in the garden, sounds and fragrance. Most people don't think about sounds when you're planning a garden, but take a moment and listen. There's a lot of sound happening out in nature. The sound of wind moving through the trees, the sounds of birds chirping and communicating with each other. 
the loudness of cicadas on a hot summer evening can bring you back to yourself. Taking a moment, slowing down, listening to nature, you hear a cacophony of sound and that really calms your soul. The late poet Mary Oliver wrote, the songs you heard singing in the leaf when you were a child is singing still. Isn't that beautiful? Fragrance, like sound, can awaken our senses and help glue us to a place and time. Think of the smell of the salty brine when you are near the sea. The smells of your own patch of earth may not be as strong as the ocean, but still they are asking to be noticed. And again, don't forget to add texture with different types of leaves and patterns, strappy grasses, big bold leaves of hibiscus, tiny flowers of woodland phlox. Variation helps elevate your garden from good to fabulous. And of course, don't forget to add lots of native plants and have fun and play. It's your garden. It's your chance to express yourself. So what have I have attempted to do here is take you on a seasonal journey through my garden and gardens that I have seen and photographed. I have also borrowed a couple of pictures from Ashley and our good friend Christina Gamoto has also contributed some pictures. So sit back and enjoy the show. Is this spring or is it winter? We kind of had a really wet, cold and snowy spring this year. Um, and this is spring because on the photograph on the left hand side, you can see my crocuses blooming. But if you look at this picture, you're also going to see some bones, what I call the bones of my garden. You're going to see some hardscape. You see the, notice the boulders, notice the log across. So that stays put all winter and gives my garden some gravitas, some grounding. And in the picture on the right, you see the beautiful, beautiful form of the tree that is trying to leaf out and not be melted with snow. To see the first bulbs and flowers of spring is like going from grayscale to technicolor. And what a most welcome sight it is. It's spring. Here is pictured Virginia bluebells, our native ephemeral, and some of my favorite bulbs, uh, daffodils. Bulbs are so much fun and they are great, great tools for novice gar gardeners. If you stay away from crocuses and tulips, which are just really too tasty for our little local bunny population, you can have an amazing amount of fun with spring bulbs. The colors and varieties are almost endless. And nothing says spring like our native flocks. Mixed here with spring bulbs, you can have just your own little color party going on. If you look at the photograph on the left, look at the strong, strong lines of that wrought iron fence with the flocks in front and then the tulips and daffodil and then the strong vertical line of the birch. This is just stunning. This was, these were both taken when I was going a little stir crazy and went out to walk in Cambridge with my mask and camera and just, enjoying some color and being out of Lexington for a moment. And notice in the picture on the right-hand side, the gardener has planted tulips in the middle of his daffodils, hoping that the poisonous daffodils will detour the rodents from having a tasty tulip snack, which is what usually happens to my tulips lately. But look at these pictures and how much fun the gardeners had mixing it up a bit. Red, white, and blue vignette. Um, these are lissoms, grape hyacinth, and tulips. And I took this picture and I've looked at this picture a lot and not until I put it in the slideshow did I realize it was red, white, and blue. So you can have your little patriotic moment with bulbs if you want. And on the right, nothing says look at me like a thousand blooming spring daffodils. This picture is at Blythewald in Rhode Island on their daffodil days. Obviously that wasn't this year, but it was last year. And hopefully next year 
we can visit them on their daffodils days again. I know we're all looking forward to that moment. Pictured here are three native early bloomers. Marsh Marigold is on the far left, and this picture was taken by the walkway um, in Lincoln Fields, that native plant garden right there. Um, red and gold columbine in the middle, and yellow trout lily on the far right. Um, I happen to think trout lily looks so tropical. I think this could possibly be from the swamps in the southern US, but it's hardy to zone four. It's a super fun plant to have, and it's really tough, so you gotta love that. It's what I'm always looking for in plants. Super tough. <laughs> and here we have some early blooming spring shrubs. We have Father Gilla on the left, which is one of our lovely native shrubs, and it has fragrant flowers, early spring blooms that are important food for early pollinators, blue-green leaves in the summer, bright yellow and red fall foliage, and it's a shrub that just holds a lot of weight and does a lot of things in your garden, so I think everybody should plant one of those. On the right, you have the more unassuming Lindera spicebush. Um, Lindera provides essential food for spicebush swallowtail and eastern tiger swallowtail butterflies, as well as having fruits consumed by hungry birds. But it's, it's a much more demure and unassuming little shrub. Spring is also time to take in garden's quiet beauty and to look at your bones of your garden, the structure, because you're not being distracted by big flowers and lots of vegetation. It's a good time to think about adding more structure or more hardscape, about adding maybe some statues. It's a good time to kind of have fun and see what you can do. Two beautiful spring blooming trees and shrubs that add so much variety and much needed pollen for bees. Um, on the left, we have amelanchier or shadberry, and on the right is echianthus. Um, shadberry produces tasty berries for the birds who kind of fight over them midsummer. And both of these shrubs have tremendous tremendous fall color and beautiful sculptural-like um, structures in the winter. Next we have a nine bark, which is really a workhorse of a shrub. It has flowers that the bees enjoy, interesting leaf structure, and I can usually just ignore this plant for years at a time. It's one tough plant. I put it in, I've pruned it maybe once in eight years, and it just does its thing my kind of plant. In the middle, we have blue, a blueberry bush. Um, I don't know why more people don't grow blueberries. They are just an amazing native shrub. They have bell-shaped spring flowers that bees love. They have blueberries that birds and people love. Bright red, beautiful fall foliage, and bright red stems that stand out in the snow, against the snow in winter. I think we should all grow more blueberries. And then of course we have our little azalea. Who doesn't love azaleas in the spring? Moving into early summer, now if you remember Ashley's garden back a couple slides ago, it, was, it looked kind of bare and not very full. And look at the difference a month makes. The allium on the right is really popping and purple and that draws your eye as well as the strappy iris in back. And then on the left, the allium sort of has gone past and you have the peonies grabbing your attention. So same garden, but looks very different depending on when you're looking at it. Let's talk about texture in the garden. On the right hand side is um, Christy Nakamoto's beautiful, beautiful garden. And look at all the different layers she has, the different leaf textures, the different colors of leaves, flowers. She, she doesn't really have any perennials or blooming flowers here. She has just shrubs and trees and it's astounding and very peaceful 
for the eye to look out. Also notice the curve in that garden bed. That also draws the eye around. And the right hand side is um, a garden that I visited a couple years ago. And this gardener, she was amazing. She had, I think over 90 different varieties of Japanese maple in her garden. And um, just notice the different leaf textures. The Japanese maple, the red one in the front is very thread-like and very lacy. And then the Japanese maple in the back has a bigger, bolder, more chartreuse leaf. And then it's combined nicely with the hydrangea in the middle that has a bigger, fatter leaf and a darker green um, thing. Now, not everybody is going to have 90 Japanese maples, but you know, you, you sort of get my idea. You can really play around with lots of fun things. It's remember, it's your garden. Summertime and the living is easy. Oh, Ashley did ask me not to sing. I'm sorry. I, I should have <laughs> <asked. laughs> um, Here we have um, Iris and Somia with Summer Blooming Azalea and a uh, native bee on Allium. Now, um, notice all the different flower shapes and colors. Look at all the different interests that that brings for the eye. Um, and remember, you know, when picking out plants to look at things like that. Um, and, you know, what are your favorite color combinations together? I really like blue and yellow. And I try to play around with that a lot in my garden. I had a client um, once who loved purples and pinks. And with only purple and pink flowers, we planted a lovely border for her that she could enjoy from her porch every morning with her coffee. And years ago, I was walking through a garden in July and I caught the fragrance of our lovely native white swamp azalea. And it perfumed the entire garden and reminded me of summer blooming jasmine in Florida which if you haven't guessed it, I am not originally from the North, I am from the South. Um, right away, I went out and I got my own swamp azalea as well as cultivars Weston Lemon Drop and Weston Sparkle Sparkler. They bloom one after another, keeping my garden in this heavenly fragrance for three weeks in late June and early July. And here, just so you know what's what, the Weston Lemon Drop is on the left. Um, the Swamp Azalea is in the middle with a hemlock. And then the Weston Sparkler is on the far right. Oh, milkweed. Can't have a slide without a show without milkweed. I grow two different types of milkweed, actually three or four, but I only have pictures of two in my garden. And uh, here we have butterfly weed with Coreopsis on the left and the common milkweed with Canada and anemone on the right. Um, and I know you already know so much about um, milkweed from last week's lovely webinar. But just to say we should all grow some milkweed in our gardens, not just for the monarchs, but also for other native pollinators. And fun fact, I've been growing milkweed for a number of years. And only this year did I discover that common milkweed has a lovely sweet fragrance. Who knew? It doesn't perfume my entire garden, but it's, it's subtle and it's, it's really nice if you happen to walk by when it's in bloom. Ah, the height of summer with all its multiple layers of color and fun. Notice just all the different things going on in both of these gardens. Um, the garden, um, on the left is a trial garden at the University of New Hampshire. Um, it's a trial pollinator garden to see what grew well and became a meadow for them. And the slide on the right is in my own backyard. And um, it's sort of a trial garden too. I planted the daylilies. I planted the Carl Forrester grass. Um, but in front, the baptisia sort of self-seeded itself there. The butterfly weed self-seeded itself there. The rose campion put itself there. And it just kind of all made this kind of brilliant mosh posh of fabulous color 
And yeah, I just love it when it happens. It's like I had a plan and it went somewhere else. The meadow. Um, as many of you who know me or have heard me speak before, I have um, been working on my meadow for a number of years. And so I had to include a couple of pictures. Um, this is just a couple weeks ago in my meadow. And on the left, we have Joe Pieweed with the phlox Jenna in the foreground. And on the right is Goldenrod with phlox Agashi and my favorite weed, Queen Anne's Lace which I used to pick when I was a little girl and bring bouquets to my mom. Not quite sure she appreciated that, but I still love Queen Anne's Lace. Um, and the thing I like about these pictures, especially the one on the right, is it reminds me of an Impressionist painting. And I always wanted to be a painter and I can't paint and I don't paint. And so my garden is my palette. And, um, you know, sometimes you plan things and sometimes miraculous, miraculously, the <laughs> it just comes out lovely like that. So, um, one never knows, at least that's how my garden goes sometimes. <laughs> Moving on into fall, things are hopefully beginning to cool down and fingers crossed the rains will be plentiful. And the gardens take on a riot of warm tone colors winding its way down from the golds, oranges, and reds, into golds, oranges, and reds. And pictured here are two medium strips planted with such sparkle. On the left, we have sedums, grasses, Sheffield daisies, and this is making a wonderful, vibrant fall display. And on the right, we just have old-fashioned cosmos that are brightening up what some consider a hell strip. And both of these pictures were just taken when I was out walking around Lexington. I'm just, you know, I'm continuously impressed with people's creativity and I just love to photograph it. So in the fall, pollinators are still working really hard. This is their last chance to get pollen, to get food before they either hibernate or migrate. So it's, it's very, very important to plant things for them to gather pollen from. Pictured here is a cabbage butterfly on our native plant, iron butterfly. Um, I discovered iron butterfly just a few years ago and it's one of my new favorite plants. It behaves very well in a garden setting, brings fabulous purple color in the fall. And I love the feathery foliage. On the right, we have a native bumblebee in the toad lily which toad lilies are not native to the US, but I allow them in my garden because they're uncommon beauty in the late season garden. They are very well behaved and they are not invasive. And again, they add a tropical orchid-like flower to the garden and, and I just think they're stunning. Fall's riot of color. Nowhere else on this planet is fall more colorful or vibrant than right here in Lexington? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, New England, New England, sorry. <laughs> um, I just, you know, want to encourage you, get outside, enjoy every moment before the whites, grays, and browns of winter come. In this picture, I was, I literally walked out my door and I saw my favorite Father Gela bush that's in the foreground, my Japanese maple and the sugar maple behind just did this riot of gorgeous color. And I'm like, okay, that's brilliant. I'm gonna have a good day. What's, what's not to like about that? Another great aspect of fall is looking at different color berries from trees and shrubs. Um, here we have a chokeberry, which the birds enjoy in the winter after it writes to their taste. In the middle, we have conquered grape, which the birds barely let get ripe before they lustily consume them, and beautyberry, which is another fun native shrub that has striking purple berries and another a favorite on the bird's dinner menu. And I just needed to show you all these beautiful, beautiful pictures of fall. We have a variety of asters, my favorite Father Gilla, Sheffield Daisy, Chokeberry, and the picture on this slide that I'm most intrigued with 
is the juxtaposition on the variegated pieris and the father gilla on the front, far right. I just, I, that combination is just so stunning for me. Right. I really like that. And ha, guess what? We're back at winter again, just when we thought we would skip it this year. Um, winter, I feel, is a time to look for whether in the snow or in landscape lights in your garden and addness and whimsy. You know, have some fun. It's cold, <laughs> something fun. Last year, my husband ordered solar mason jars. They're very inexpensive and you can put them all over the garden and they light up the dark winter nights that begin like at three in the afternoon. And I find having light garden in the winter just really makes it magical. Ice is another interesting aspect of winter that I hadn't really noticed. Natural ice sculptures can be brilliant mm. and sparkling. Yeah. <laughs> winter as a time when nature regroups. Think of it as an energetic break from producing leaves, flowers, and fruits. And we should think of winter as a time for rest and regrouping a chance for us to recharge and get ready for the stunning displays of spring. spring. Life is short. Enjoy your garden in all seasons. Get out and play. Don't worry about making mistakes. Mistakes are just your opportunity to try something new. And now Ashley is going to take us through some transitions of Gardens pictured at different times of year. Take it away, Ashley. Thank you, Georgia. That was really fun. I love the fact that you said your garden is your palette. That's, that's really rings. What I wanted to talk about is the different gardens and how they look. Here is very early spring in my garden. And you can see, you can see the iris. And you see hosta coming up. There's a gila bore there over there in the far left. And you see a daffodil or two. This is a deep shade garden. And yet, come summer, it gets filled up. There's the same dogwood tree in both of them. Here it's filled up with the astilbe and the lilies down here and the hosta now in full bloom. Um, both of the gardens have an armillary in the same one. But they both are beautiful in their own right. And so, you know, if you look at the garden and figure out how can I make this really stand out at each time and figuring out your spacing between plants so you don't overwhelm everything. Though it's true, I do go in there and pull out some astilbe uh, come late August, um, but it can be really gorgeous. Let's do the next one. Georgia, can you do the next? There we go. Um, I wanted to talk about sculpture in the garden because garden ornaments can really do a nice thing for you in the garden, especially in the winter. Here, this pig has a fine but not necessarily total necessary role in the summer. He's there and he gets buried by my flowers. He's much more prominent under a glaze of ice or against the bleak winter landscape. Like the poet Thomas More says, a garden ornament in the winter can be the last rose of summer left blooming alone. It can be even more beautiful without the competition from the garden. Moreover, it ensures you that spring will come. And in this case, with this pig, with the deep snowfalls, we may only see the tips of his ears. And then as it begins to melt, we rejoice in watching his eyes, his nose, his mouth slowly coming out of the snow. And we know that spring is going to come. And now the last one. You want to do the next one, Georgia? Hi. Thanks. And here, these are Christina Gomoda's pictures, which we've taken at different times. And what she's done here is given her garden great structure and shape to the big space that she has. Think of your winter plants, your evergreens as the skeleton or bones in your garden. You need to almost decide on these plants first 
and only then think about what you could plant between them for the rest of the year. Here, she hasn't planted much in between them. She has more garden ornaments, but the structure remains this path and going, leading down to the same big tree at the end. Once you've planted your structural plants, you then put in your bulbs, your perennials, or annuals amongst them. And the structure is going to give you interest over the winter months and will hold everything together for the rest of the year. If you're starting your garden from a scratch, you could make a little plan to outline where you want those structural plants to be. Matter of fact, we're going to have a program on that in September. Um, you can go on Pinterest and find some really good ideas for structure in your garden. Evergreen trees and shrubs are a good way to keep color in your garden all year. The Hinoki Cypress Yellow Ribbon in Zones 4 to 8 is a fantastic half and half mix of deep emerald and golden yellow. And of course, holly, which is one of my favorites, is a staple of decoration. And with the holly comes berries and different sizes and shapes of holly, whether you have tall pyramidal or little round ones. Be sure to get a male and a female. Um, and with the holly comes ivy, if you really want to get going with that, which comes in different sizes. You plant holly such as winterberry, zones three to nine for scarlet berries, or chokeberry, zones two to six for maroon, and china berry. Oh, the china berry we can't do here, and it's zones eight. Um, fire thorn, or pyracantha, can produce red or orange berries in abundance, and these are that's perfect for the birds, and the birds love the holly. If it's colorful branches you're after, then there's plenty of choice. Uh, the Henry Lauder's walking stick has colorful contorted branches, as well as catkins on the late winter and early spring. Some varieties of willow, such as the Salix alba, have colorful stems. You can even weave them into living structures to make the most of their impact. And the dogwood um, uses eye-catching stems and vibrant reds and yellows that shine even in the snow. It's a very architectural plant, great for the back of a border. And many trees have very colorful bark that you can use. Uh, the Western Himalayan silver birch is pure white, while the Alpine um, silver gum has patchy bark that looks like it's painted with watercolors. And then there's the Tibetan cherry tree, which looks stunning in the snow. The ice, snow, and frost, as Georgia pointed out, can produce some truly spectacular textures in the low sun. And look at the textures that Christina has in this garden. And ornamental grasses are the perfect background for textural displays with varieties of mizacanthus and maiden grass, which are both popular choices. And they look beautiful in the late fall and winter and they'll stand up and keep your animals and wildlife happy. Um, Ashley, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. There was a question in the chat. I, I don't know how to, I don't know names with plants. So I'm sorry if I'm not being helpful, but they just wanted to make sure that the slides were on the right thing that you were talking about. I don't know what this slide is. <laughs> um, this is the one with the cherry tree. Is that that tree there? I don't know if that's a cherry tree. I don't know which what tree that is. Okay. So do you? I um. It could be a tree tree, could be a dogwood. I can't, I don't I can't see it well enough to tell from the shape of it. Yeah. And the slides were not supposed to be advancing. Matter of fact, I'm sort of stayed and stuck on the winter thing, Catherine. Um, because I wanted to really emphasize what you can do in winter. The winter garden can be beautiful. And we you need to look at it a little bit more carefully. I find when people ask me what to plant, they never talk about evergreens. And given our climate, you need evergreens in your garden because it's going to be awfully gray otherwise. Now we're open for questions. Um, George, I don't know about this picture. Oh, so this picture is just um, uh, to show you the difference um, between my meadow in the early um, early spring and my meadow now. So, you know, again, just how things kind of grow up. <laughs> how they can look beautiful. And then if you have too much, you cut back. Yep, then you got to get in there and prune a little bit. Um, I also uh, actually have some list of plants and stuff. Should I wait to show those until after the yeah. questions? 
go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is not an exhaustive list. This is a very short list, just to have it on one slide, of different kind of plants that you can grow um, that are native um, and that have four seasons of interest. Um, also, I realized during this talk um, that I need to get out and take more pictures of my red twig dogwoods and my grasses in the winter. So that's on me. <laughs> um, also here is um, a list of recommended books and websites um, where you can get information, buy plants, um, that sort of thing. And I thought this would be a good time to have questions. This is a picture of our native hummingbird on cardinal flower. Matt, is there any way you can send out those last two lists that Georgia painstakingly developed? Um, I, I was just about to ask, actually, um, Georgia, would you be willing to share your slides or at least those two slides as like a PDF or something? No problem. I can do that, Matt. Yeah. So if you send those to me, I'll send them out to everyone who um, attended or signed up in, a, in the recap that we do with the video. Perfect. Thank you. Georgia had suggested uh, way back when I was looking for program ideas that we do one on books and uh, nobody else jumped at it. So I've kind of put, put that on the side, but there's a list of good books that she's given you and winter is coming. So we can all sit and read those and see if we can find something else. Oh, I guess we should start our videos again. Okay, let me. Where are you? Um, there we go. Now we're all. Okay. We're open for questions. If anybody has a question, no open questions. Huh? Okay. Um, yes, I would definitely emphasize uh, the grasses, I think, are lovely at all seasons, as a matter of fact. I do find um, a friend of mine who's going to be speaking on meadows in September, she admired mine because she said, I've managed to stake them. Because come the fall with too many uh, wild storms, they can get broken down. But if you stake them, they will last until almost February. Um, yeah, it's funny. I don't stake mine because I'm kind of a lazy gardener. I'm like you, Ashley. <laughs> but, um, and they do, some of them do flop. Some of them are better at holding straight. But um, even if they aren't staked upright, um, still having them down on the ground provides um, habitat for um, bees, because they are they are still hibernating in there, whether they're upright or, or over. Um, but staking them is a really a good idea. We could do a whole program on staking different flowers, because that is, it's, it's hard to do and make look natural and not soldierly, if you will. Right, and if, and if you get a storm like we had a couple of weeks ago, that really beat down a lot of flowers. Yes. And, you know, I don't want my asters, which are just coming into bud, to be down on the ground at this point. They can be down on the ground later for the wildlife. The wildlife has plenty of food at the moment. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, that storm blew off a lot of um, bulbs on my, just my annual lantana. It's just oh. completely bald now. <laughs> <laughs> so. Which is always a shame. Um, it is. It's like, okay, here we are. Nature at its best. Yeah, yeah. What, what can I do now? But um, I think there are lots of things, and what you had in your pictures are wonderful, um, and how it went from season to season. And if we look at our gardens as full year, and not just as, I found in New England, people often just think of the spring garden, the yeah. bulbs, the daffodils and the tulips. And you did mention planting the daffodils around the tulip to protect it um, from the wildlife, which is important. But if we can start looking for the summer and the fall, fall gardens can be gorgeous. My garden changes its color palette. It is in pinks and blues in the spring. You saw an early picture of that with the peonies and the, of the allium. And by this time, it's really yellows and reds and, with the reliatrus and so forth and the asters. Well, I think um, what this time is, you know, doing um, for us as a, <laughs> as a country, as a world, it's given us a little time to stop and be in places, be in our gardens for longer than we ever have, because we're not rushing off to work or garden club meetings or the library. We are home. And, and I think 
while, you know, it's been kind of a forced thing, it, it's kind of nice to stop and take stock of what's going on outside and just notice things. I think it's very healthy for us as humans to slow down a little bit. So maybe it's not necessarily all a bad thing, but, um, you know, I would like to visit other people's gardens at some point again. <laughs> well, I must say, I have looked at other people's gardens. You can go look at them with a mask on. Somebody suggested that we just have a garden club tour and open our houses that so people could come by and see the garden. And, you know, you don't have to be out there talking arm in arm, you know? Yes, yes. Close together, but you're right. I think in a way, a lot of this has, you know, we've added to creativity and what we're doing in the garden and stuff. Although I do worry about what's happening with school children and other people who are the essential workers. Yes, I, it's, it's easy or for us where we can be at home and work, but for people who are young folks who are just beginning their lives in college or people trying to finish high school or elementary school, I think this time is a little devastating for them and very right. tricky to navigate. Right, very difficult. Well, Marlene's had great ideas for year-round beauty and I don't see any questions, Matt. Um, um, just in case, you, you, everyone, just a reminder, you can write a question in the Q&A, um, or if you raise your hand, I think I can unmute you if you want to ask directly. It's a good time to get two gardeners to ask. <laughs> Anything you want. And if not, we'll all go back to our gardens and do a rain dance out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It doesn't look like it's going to rain at all. Yeah. Um, one um, plant that I left out, because I don't know why, I don't have pictures of it, um, that I love um, is uh, hydrangeas. We have a lot of native hydrangeas that are lovely, um, especially the oak leaf hydrangea, because it has such lovely structure and such huge leaves um, that are maroon in the fall. And those big, beautiful, pinnacle white um, flowers. Um, so that's another great shrub to add to your garden if you need some shrubs and structure. And it doesn't seem to be a very demanding structure. No, it's high, that's that's my kind of plant. I like plants that don't don't ask that much of me. <laughs> what I about think, you? I think you have uh, some questions. Some questions. Um, is Joe Pie weed invasive? I don't find it is. So. Here's the thing about invasive. If you're a native to a place, you can't invade it. So um, does it, can it spread around your garden if it self seeds? Yes, it can. But invasive means you are taking over a place that you are not native to. It, so Joba pie weed is a native plant. It can move around, but it's not like um, some like Japanese knotweed or something. It's not invasive like that, but it can move around but I like the fact that it does that. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I can put it in an area to my garden that I want to populate with something yeah. or conceal something. Yes. It is big, I'll tell you one thing, with Joe Pie, you may need to chop it down uh, May, mid-June, yeah. so it doesn't grow to be eight feet tall. You want to be you, five or six feet tall. You could even chop down the front half of it and leave the bottom half of it tall and have two different kind of looking plants there. Did you, um, Irwin wants to know, did you talk about invasives, even ornamental types, and how you manage them? Um, I didn't um, particularly talk about invasive. Um, invasives is a great idea for another program, and um, you manage invasives in different ways for different types of invasives. Um, you know, you have to keep cutting back. You have to keep ripping out. You have to smother. Um, it is kind of an ongoing fight um, yes. with different invasives. Or you have the goat lady. I'm sorry? Or the, you, know, you ask for the goat lady to come. Yes, exactly. So, um, and come, come often. <laughs> yes. It definitely depends on what the invasive is. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, where do you usually buy your plants? Um, I've brought by them at a variety of places. I 
Um, last year, I got some bargains at the Native Plant Trust end of year season sale, but I don't think they're doing that this year. But they are doing online. You can order plants online and pick them up. Russell's Garden, um, I have found this year to have a really nice native plant selection. Um, it's expanded. Um, I mail order some from Prairie Moon Nursery. Um, I get some from a wholesale nursery in um, New Hampshire. Um, McHugh's Mahoney's, I haven't been too happy with this year, but you know, that that's just me. <laughs> um, but so I get- We've had a hard year. Yes, yeah. I, I, you know, it's been a hard year for us all, let's face it. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering about that Baronia letter mania. That was really lovely. And I had uh, not really seen that before. And I thought, oh, that is beautiful. Um, yeah, Ashley, um, there's, there's uh, someone raising their hand. I know we haven't done that yet, but uh, I'm going to allow them to talk, and then they can just ask their question directly. OK. Oh, there's another one I have here, too. Uh, Christina Gomoda, you are on you, uh, oh, you just have to you have to unmute yourself and then you can ask your question to the question that someone asked about the tree on the in the back of the perennial garden uh, that you saw the winter time yeah and that tree was on our property 35 years ago and it's a wild crab apple oh nice thank you christina and through the years, we lost the lower branches, and so I decided not to get rid of it, but to use it as a sculpture all year round. Hmm. Okay, thank you. And we have one more question. Good question, matter of fact. If you are a new gardener, which season is a good one to start with, giving the most bang for the buck? If wow. you were a new gardener, do you mean what season is a good time to plant or what season should you focus on? I think what season they're focusing on, giving the most bang for the buck. If you're planting, you know, you're planting out. If, you, if you're, well, if you're planting now, you should wait till September. But I think the two biggest things for the buck are spring and fall. Um, you know, your garden is going to be hot and tired in the middle of August. Um, but spring, because, you know, we've just been through winter, you want some beautiful color. But you also want to be out there in the fall and have beautiful color. So, <laughs> so I would say both. <laughs> That's just me. Um, but maybe start with some spring flowery bulbs and some shrubs. Um, that's a really good question. I haven't been that in that place for a really long time. What about you, Ashley? I don't know. I'm thinking. Thinking. I mean, I, I'm, I'm matter of fact, I'm moving past the bulbs. So I must say, these catalogs come in, and I'm drooling with all of them. I'm wanting how many more can I fit in the garden? Exactly. Um, I would matter of fact, one flower I would pick for sure, which I think gives a big bang for your buck, is allium. I could do it better with flowers. Yes, in a season. Allium lasts for a long time. It feeds the pollinators. It's lovely. And when it's dry, you don't cut it down. It just stands there waving in the breeze saying, I'm here, I'm here. And it really looks good at all times. So I think that is one flower. Peonies are another one that look beautiful. They have the gorgeous flowers in the spring, but their foliage is phenomenal. And you know, just having that, here and there in your garden is really quite pretty. And so, I guess allium, I'm allium also has, there's a lot of different kinds of allium um, that I've been experimenting with lately, which kind of extends your allium season, if you will. So I have little short pink ones. I have ones that look like drumsticks. Um, you have the great big tall ones? Um, I have the, the tall ones, so the, there's there's lots of fun with allium, and usually bunnies don't like it because it is in the onion family. Right, and deer don't like it either. Yes, <laughs> so. Very good plant to have, which reminds me of a question somebody just asked me today. She said, how do you get rid of your chipmunks? And I told her, I am the most lucky woman. I have a weasel who suddenly showed up, 
and weasels are carnivores. And this is a cute little guy who runs back and forth on my terrace. And we haven't seen a single chipmunk or rabbit since he appeared. So I think he's really taking care of them all. Well, so. and if, you, if you want to rinse him out, I could, I could use some <laughs> <of> love over here. <laughs> like a nice little weasel. That's right. Um, oh, I wasn't very good in giving which season, but how about if you have two favorite flowers that you would plant? My two favorite flowers? Um, um, shrubs, I'm going to say Fadagilla. Um, flowers, I... Um, False indigo, Batesia. I really like that. It sort of looks like a sweet pea um, that has beautiful flowers um, in the spring and bright golden um, leaves, leaves in the fall. So I, I think those are two. It's hard to pick your two favorite children. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, that it is. Um, are there edible plants you can suggest in your garden? You go to France, you go to Paris, you see beautiful, I can't go now, but there was beautiful chard, multicolored chard, the last time I was there, in amongst the flowers. And the, you, you look at the grocery, that multicolored chard has gorgeous stems and deep green leaves. And that is one that I would definitely put in there. Um, um, also uh, berries, uh, you know, blueberries, raspberries are also native. Um, strawberries, wild strawberries, great ground cover, and you get to eat them. Um, shadberries, if you get them before the birds, you can eat them. Um, there, um, actually somebody uh, just wrote an article for me, I haven't uh, edited it yet, about the, um, the ecological value of growing your own tomatoes. So um, they're, you know, Anything could, that's edible can be put in your garden. I mean, you don't want to put it next to anything that you're putting poison on, but you shouldn't be poisoning anything. Any yes, earlier in your lecture, and I will just emphasize the blueberry. Mm. I had a blueberry bush for a long time in this property, and it is gorgeous. And I just found in a friend's um, garden, she has three of them. And they are so beautiful in the fall, this brilliant red, it's just, you know, people get the uh, burning bush because they love the burning, because uh, it's red leaves and you shouldn't have burning bush at the base if you don't want it. But blueberries have the same brilliant red leaves. They're gorgeous. And you have those beautiful blueberries. Yes. If yes. you're not going to pick them and eat them, the birds will love you and they will be with you forever. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So I would definitely, definitely think of blueberries, nothing else. And they're not hard. That's not a hard yeah. crop at all. Well, uh, one more, is there one more? No. Oh, what about gila boars? Oh, <laughs> what about gila boars? Uh, they're lovely. They bloom really early. I like, um, I mean, they're literally flowering before anything is. Um, they have great structure. They are not native, but they're not invasive. I, I like them. I, I, I understand I, if you look underneath them, and I keep looking underneath mine, and I haven't found it. They will have lots of little babies. Yes, mine has, I've had babies. I started out with three halobores and then I had lots of halobores. I've given some to other garden club members, but I, I, yeah, they will, they do reproduce, so to speak. I'll have to go out and look again. Oh, is there a place, class, for a total beginner to learn gardening in Lexington or around here? I would tell you, well, because I'm the Lexington Field and Garden Club, that's one place to learn a good deal. You will find all sorts of people. Georgia and I are not unique. There are a lot of good gardeners in that garden club, and they're more than happy to tell you and to take you out, plus the fact that you can work on the islands or the public gardens here in town, like Hancock Clark. Uh, and, yeah, the house, that herb garden, that is done by one of the groups. Uh, the Minuteman statue is taken care of by one of the groups. Um, you know, so you can learn from older gardeners who have done that at over the community center. You could definitely learn from our civic gardening people and they will tell you all sorts of things. It's easy to join the Lexington Field and Garden Club. Uh, you can look it up on the web and you join. It's cheap, it's $25. And with that, you get a coupon that allows you to get 10% off at the various um, stores around here, nurseries. And um, you'll meet a lot of people. 
which is sort of nice when you're feeling lonely you can meet people i know when i retired it was lovely to have the lexington field garden club be there um but i also have learned a great deal from all my friends there so i thank you all for coming and i thank georgia for being with us again georgia will have to dream up another program for next year for you <laughs> um, i do tell you she's a good speaker she'll go to garden clubs and you can learn a good deal from her. Um, thank you all. Have a good two weeks. We will see you, I think it's September 2nd. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you,